Today we will be talking about the muscles of mastication. Some definitions that you should know are origin, which is the end of the muscle that is attached to the least movable structure. When you think of origin, think anchor. The insertion is the end of the muscle that is attached to the more movable structure. The insertion, in most cases, moves towards the origin. So if you know the insertion and the origin of the muscle, then more than likely you will know the action. For example, if the muscle's insertion is the mandible and the origin is the zygomatic arch, think that would mean that the muscle would bring the mandible up towards or elevate the zygomatic arch. Some more definitions that really should be a review from anatomy of, and physiology. Remember if it's synergist, there's some synergy works together, antagonist works opposite. And it's important to understand that mastication is the act of chewing and grinding. Deglutition is the act of swallowing. Phonation, the act of speech. Muscles may connect to the underlying bones in one of two ways, either direct or indirect. Remember, when we're talking about direct, the muscle fibers are embedded directly into the periosteum. Remember that the periosteum is a membrane that lines the outer surfaces of all bones. Indirect is when the muscle fibers connect to a tendon, and then that tendon attaches to the bone. There are different movements of the mandible. When you depress the mandible, maybe opposite of what you think, you're actually opening the mouth. So depressing the mandible opens the mouth, elevates, closes. Protrusion, think pro, forward, retrusion, re-back. Lateral shift is when the mandible goes side to side. Remember when you're chewing, your, your jaw doesn't just go up and down. It has to move side to side also when you're masticating. So in the lateral shift, mandible goes side to side, muscles on one side contract only. The mandible moves away from the contracting side. Therefore, if muscles are contracting on the right, the mandible moves to the left. It's important for you to take a look and review the mandible. of areas that I want to make reference to are the mylohyoid line. We're going to learn later on today about the mylohyoid muscle. But the mylohyoid line, number 10, is the point of attachment of the mylohyoid muscle which forms the floor of the mouth. Also, I'd like you to take a look at number 1, excuse, excuse me, which is the mandibular condyle and you should take a look at that triangular depression on the anterior portion of the condyle. That's the pterygoid fovea. Later on in this lecture we'll be talking about point of attachment for a muscle right on the pterygoid fovea. Interesting things you should know about the muscles of mastication is all the muscles of mastication originate on the upper two-thirds of the skull and insert the mandible. So that's going to affect your action. All are innervated by the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. Damage would cause lack of muscle function. And all receive their arterial blood supply from the maxillary artery, which is a branch of the external carotid artery. Later in the semester, we will be talking about 
the blood supply, but you should know muscles of mastication receive their blood supply from the maxillary artery. When we look at muscles of mastication, there are four main muscles. The master, temporalis, the medial pterygoid, and the lateral pterygoid muscle. The masseter muscle is a two-headed muscle. This works to elevate the mandible. So it closes the mandible. The masseter muscle is the most superficial muscle of mastication. Again, it's a two-headed muscle. It's a rectangular shape and has vertical fibers. Its origin is the zygomatic arch. Insertion is the lateral surface of the mandible. So again, if you think about insertion and origin, you can understand its action or function. So again, if the insertion is the mandible, origin is zygomatic, it's going to elevate the mandible. It brings the molars together for crushing and grinding. Masseter actually means chewer. So it's the chewer muscle. It forms half of the mandibular sling. The medial pterygoid forms the other half. The masseter muscle may become overdeveloped due to bruxism. If you put your hand in front of at the inferior border of your mandible and bring up the fingertips to above the ears and clench, you can feel your masseter muscle. Again, this may become overdeveloped due to bruxism, somebody who grinds. The parotid gland, which we will learn about later on in the semester, lies on top of the muscle. And if there is some hypertrophy with this masseter muscle, it could shut off the flow of the parotid gland. So it, sh it could cause less of a salivary flow. Here's a question for you. The masseter runs downward until it inserts on the lower border and angle of the mandible. Imagine the fibers growing shorter. What action does the masseter have on the mandible? Answer, it elevates the mandible. So let's just take a look at the temporal bone and you can take a look at the temporal fossa. Remember a fossa, remember a fossa is a depression on a bony surface. So look at the temporal fossa, which is located on the lateral surface of the skull, which ca contains the body of the temporalis muscle. I'm going to move my mouse. All right here is the fossa in here. That'll be important when we're talking about attachment. So the temporalis muscle is the largest and most powerful muscle of mastication. If you put your hand by your temporal, your temple, excuse me, excuse me, you can feel the temporalis muscle. Then move up when you think about the location of that fossa, so if you move superior to your temple, you can still feel that muscle. So due to the fan shape, some fibers run in a horizontal direction and some run in a more vertical direction. This contributes to the different actions this muscle can perform. Again, this is often visible when chewing, and this can be overdeveloped in bodybuilders. Think about when they clench and grunt. So again, when we think about the temporal fossa, that is from the superior temporal line down to the zygomatic arch. 
Insertion is by means of a tendon. And the coronoid process of the mandible and the anterior border of the ramus. So when you hear the word fascia, think of a sheet of loose connective tissue on top of muscle fibers. You're going to hear that when we're talking about different muscles. So again, temporalis muscle, the origin is the temporal fossa, and insertion is means by means of a tendon on the coronoid process of the mandible and the anterior border of the ramus. To locate this muscle, again, place fingers in the region of the temporal fossa as mouth is being opened and closed. This muscle can be overdeveloped, as I had mentioned. So again, if you're thinking about the origin and insertion, then you should understand that because of the different directions the fiber moves in, it can elevate the mandible, which the, this happens when the entire muscle is contracting, pulling the coronoid process upward. Note the insertion is inferior to the origin. It can also retract the mandible. This is when only the posterior fibers contract resulting in a horizontal pulling action in the posterior direction. It pulls the mandible backward. Note that the insertion is anterior and inferior to the insertion. And the antagonist of it is an antagonist of the lateral pterygoid muscles. It's protrusive action. The lateral pterygoid causes the mandible to protrude. The temporalis, with the help of some suprahyoid muscles, re reverse this action. So remember, antagonist works in the opposite. So it works opposite of the lateral pterygoid. I just wanted to show you a picture of the masseter and temporalis. If you take a look at one. I am going to just turn on a hyperlink here. This is going to show you the masseter and the temporalis muscle. Show it again the masseter, the temporalis, and we're going to talk about the digastric in a little while. I'll do it one more time, masseter and temporalis. Okay, temporalis, masseter. You may want to take and review the master and temporalis muscle in the learning guide. This slide here just gives you the answers to one of the learning activities. Note I have put down where the origin is and where the insertion. Origin, temporalis, insertion is down here right here. So the medial pterygoid muscle is a smaller, weaker version of the masseter. It's located on the medial surface of the mandible. Fibers of origin run in an oblique direction, inferiorly and laterally to points of insertion. A portion of the muscle can be palpated by going superior and posterior to the maxillary tuberosity. So think about the very last tooth on the maxillary arch. The maxillary tuberosity is posterior to that, and so when you're feeling for it, you can feel 
by going superior and posterior to the maxillary tuberosity. So the origin is the medial surface of the lateral pterygoid plate. Remember that is on the what bone? Sphenoid. And the insertion is on the medial surface of the ramus and angle of the mandible. You want to note that the medial pterygoid and master muscles have similar position and function. The medial pterygoid is internal, where the masseter is external. So the medial pterygoid elevates the mandible, forms one half of the mandibular sling, as I mentioned before, the masseter muscle is the other half. protrudes the mandible, and it shifts the mandible laterally. It works with the lateral pterygoid muscle. So if it shifts the mandible laterally, it moves it side to side. Let's talk about the lateral pterygoid muscle. This is a short muscle with horizontal fibers. It has two origins and two insertions with, a common, with common middle fibers. Origins is the infratemporal surface of the greater wing of the sphenoid, which lies deep in the infratemporal fossa, almost entirely under the cover of the temporalis muscle. It has two separate points of origin, then the muscle fibers merge, but then they split again for its two separate points of insertion. Remember that the origin, which we'll learn in a moment, Origins are anterior and medial to the insertion. So when we talk about the insertion of the lateral pterygoid muscle, we want to look at the articular disc of the TMJ, which is a fibrous disc of tissue which, which sits between the temporal and mandibular bones. We'll be learning more about that shortly. The condyle of the mandible, and it also inserts on the condyle of the mandible. More specifically, the triangular depression that I, I mentioned earlier, which is below the condyle, called the pterygoid fovea. Remember that insertions are posterior and lateral to the origin. Lateral pterygoid muscles are the shortest muscles of mastication. Maybe on this hyperlink. See the lateral pterygoid? And it has two points of insertion in origin. So the lateral pterygoid depresses the mandible, which is assisted by the supra and infrahyoid. The lateral shift, when we talk about shift upon opening, means one side is contracting before the other. Lateral shift is contraction on one side only, and this movement side to side is assisted by the medial pterygoid. So the function of the lateral pterygoid is to depress the mandible and also to protrude the mandible. The lateral pterygoid muscle can occasionally have spasms when the TMJ is in discomfort. What you'd want to do is put a moist towel in a baggie, put it in the microwave, take the towel out of the baggie, and give it to the patient, and that should help with the spasms.
oftentimes that's when the, the jar is open too long. Okay, so we look at lateral shift, which we've talked about, which is contraction on one side only. And this is assisted by the medial pterygoid. So right, excuse me, left lateral shift is when the right lateral pterygoid and medial pterygoid muscles contract and the left lateral pterygoid and medial pterygoid relax. So now I ask what happens during a right lateral shift? During a right lateral shift, the left lateral and medial pterygoid contract while the right lateral and medial pterygoid Relax. Here's a posterior view. If you take a look at number one, that is your medial pterygoid. Remember this forms the, the other half of the mandibular sling. This is anterior on the external part, which would be the master. So internally you have the medial pterygoid, externally the master. And here is the lateral pterygoid. Doesn't show quite as distinctly that it has two bellies. Here's just another view of the muscles of mas mastication. Remember the styloid process is part of the the temporal bone. Buccinator muscle, excuse me, buccinator muscle we'll be talking about next week and that is a muscle of facial expression and that helps to keep the food on the occlusal table. So you want to just take a look at the temporal muscle or temporalis, the lateral pterygoid, medial pterygoid, What's missing from this would be the external masseter muscle. Okay, I'm going to just take a moment and have you look at this video on muscles of mastication. Note that they talk about the platysma muscle, which is a muscle that we will be talking about next week when we talk about muscles of facial expression.
hope you found that helpful. Kind of nice not to have to listen to my voice for a moment. When we talk about the, move on to the hyoid muscles. The hyoid muscles are accessory muscles of mastication. These aid in depression of the mandible, raising the hyoid bone during swallowing, and retraction of the mandible. There are two divisions, suprahyoid and infrahyoid. If you think about your knowledge of these words, suprahyoid, above the hyoid, infra, below. That's just a review of the hyoid bone. Remember, the hyoid bone does not articulate with any other bone. It's used for muscle attachment, the skeleton of the tongue. So again, the suprahyoid muscles are located above the hyoid bone. All four insert into the hyoid bone. So remember, when we think about action, insertion always goes towards the origin. Excuse me, the, the action of the suprahyoid are to depress the mandible with the lateral pterygoid, retract with the temporalis muscle, elevate, it raises the hyoid bone during swallowing, and it also helps to suspend the hyoid bone. The four muscles of the digastric, we'll talk about the mylohyoid, as we already mentioned that that forms the muscular floor of the mouth. Geniohyoid and stylohyoid. The digastric muscle has an unusual arrangement of fibers. There are muscle fibers at either end called the anterior and posterior bellies. The bellies are connected in the middle by a tendon. This tendon connects to the hyoid bone by a fibrous loop of connective tissue and can slide back and forth through this loop. This is the insertion for the muscle. So if we talk about the anterior belly, we talk about the origin, which is the digastric fossa. This is located on the lower inside border of the mandible. The anterior be belly, when it contracts, the hyoid is pulled forward and upward during swallowing. The posterior belly, mastoid process, remember that is the temporal bone. So the posterior belly, when it contracts, the hyoid bone is pulled back and upward during mandibular retraction. When both bellies in the dig digastric muscle contract at the same time, the mandible is being depressed. Let me click on the hyperlink here, show you the digastric muscle. Just that same picture I showed you, but if you note the tendon, that loop, it connects to the hyoid bone. Just one more time. Okay, again, remember when both bellies contract at the same time the mandible is being depressed. The next muscle we'll talk about is the mylohyoid muscle, which is a flat triang triangular muscle that lies anterior and superior to the digastric muscle. It forms the muscular floor of the mouth. When you look at origin, we talked about the mylohyoid line on the mandible, which is in the inside of the mandible. The mylohyoid raphe, these fibers run towards the midline and join together with fibers from the mylohyoid muscle on opposite side of the mouth to insert into a tendon known as the mylohyoid raphe. 
So again, the mylohyoid raphe. A raphe is a ridge or line marking the union of two similar structures. The posterior fibers run backwards and downwards to insert into the hyoid. So again, fibers that run towards the midline and join together with fibers from the mylohyoid muscle on the opposite side of the mouth insert into it to a tendon. And remember I said two like things, and that's called the mylohyoid raphe. Deniohyoid. Think about the words you know. Denio is the denio tubercles, which are in the inside of the mandible. So the geniohyoid muscles, excuse me, are long slender muscles, long slender muscle that lies superior to the mylohyoid muscle. Again, the genial tubercles are located on the inner surface of the mandible. It depresses the mandible if the hyoid bone is fixed in position by the infrahyoid. The infrahyoid will hold the, the hyoid in place. It elevates the hyoid during swallowing. This happens when the hyoid is not fixed in position and the infrahyoid are relaxed. So if you take a look, here's the mylohyoid muscles and the geniohyoid muscles, right and left. Remember, mylohyoid is the muscular floor of the mouth. So here are the words stylohyoid. Origin is the styloid process, which is on the temporal bone. So this is a thin round muscle that lies superior and medial to the posterior belly of digaster. Please note that since this muscle has no attachment to the mandible, it does not aid in the depression of the mandible. Notice that it stabilizes the hyoid and elevates and retracts the hyoid. Infrahyoid are located below the hyoid. These muscles stabilize the hyoid bone into place. This happens when the suprahyoids are helping to depress the mandible. It also depresses the hyoid during speech. When that happens, the suprahyoids must be relaxed. So we will be talking about omohyoid, sternohyoid, sternothyroid. Think about the word. This is the only one that does not attach to the hyoid in the thyrohyoid. If you think of the omohyoid, omo in Latin means shoulder. So the origin is the scapula, the insertion is the hyoid. So if you think about the insertion goes towards the or origin, it would then make sense that it would pull the hyoid downward. Sternohyoid, origin would be the upper border of the sternum, think sterno, sternum. Insertion, again hyoid, think of where the sternum is in relation to the hyoid. So the insertion goes towards the origin, so this would pull the hyoid downward. Sternothyroid The origin is the upper sternum. The insertion is the side of the thyroid cartilage. Remember the th thyroid cartilage is the Adam's apple. So again, think about the origin and insertion and it would make sense that this would pull the larynx upward. Excuse me, downward. 
The sternothyroid muscle's action is to pull the larynx downward. Thyrohyoid muscle, the origin is the side of the thyroid cartilage and the insertion is the hyoid. So this raises the larynx during swallowing. Be certain to refer to your learning guide for further information on all of these muscles as well as learning activities for quick identification of these muscles. So let's think about the, the activity, the coordinated muscle activity. When the mouth closes, which is during elevation, the masseter, temporalis, and medial pterygoid must contract. So I think of my teeth meet, brings it up, it closes. The masseter, temporalis, and medial pterygoid. The lateral pterygoids and hyoid muscles must relax. During depression, that's when the mouth opens, the lateral pterygoids contract with the hyoid muscles. And then the elevator muscles, which would be the masseter, temporalis, and medial pterygoid, they relax. talked about protrusion, which would be the lateral and medial pterygoid muscles contract, while the masseter and the temporalis and the hyoid muscles relax. During re retraction, the temporalis and the suprahyoid contract. Remember those horizontal fibers of the temporalis muscle. That will help you to think of moving back. The infrahyoid muscles must also contract while the lateral pterygoid, medial pterygoid, and masseter relax. We've already talked about the lateral shift, but it seems repeating. This is when the lateral pterygoid and medial pterygoids on one side only contract. The mandible moves towards the side that is relaxed. Therefore, the mandible moves away from the side that is contracting. And now during swallowing, the infrahyoids relax so the hyoid bone can be lifted. If you put your hand and feel your, your hyoid, which is above the thyroid cartilage, about two millimeters, and swallow, you can see that it moves up. The mandible is elevated. That's because the lateral pterygoid muscles relax and the suprahyoids contract to raise the hyoid bone. This lifts the thyroid cartilage which presses against the epiglottis. Epiglottis covers the opening of the trachea. We'll be talking more about swallowing just the different phases of swallowing. Okay, so again, it starts in the buccal phase, form that bolus of food, then it goes to the pharyngeal stage, pharyngeal stage, to the esophageal. So let's review the muscles. Okay, muscle A inserts on the, which one is it? First of all, you should know that muscle A is the temporalis muscle which is the muscle of mastication, and that inserts on the coronoid process of the mandible, so number three. Muscle B, which, is, which of the following is true? You 
answered number one, is the prime mover in closing elevating the jaw, you would be correct. B is the masseter muscle. The action of muscle A is primarily to which of the following? If you said three, protrude the mandible, you are correct. And remember, A is the lateral pterygoid, which has two heads, origin and for insertion. Muscle B is the excuse me. If you said muscle B is the medial pterygoid, you are correct. That forms half of the mandibular sling with muscle C there, which is the masseter. And if you take a look at how it is goes like a sling, like that. Medial pterygoid, masseter. Very similar, masseter is external, medial pterygoid, internal. Okay, the action of muscle B, we've already discovered that is the medial pterygoid. Is it to assist C, the masseter muscle, assist A, which is the lateral pterygoid? Does it work as a synergist to the temporalis? So it's synergy works together, or is it all of the above? If you answered for all of the above, you are correct. Remember, my teeth meet masseter temporalis and medial pterygoid all elevate the mandible. Here are some useful websites for head and neck you may want to take a look at. That concludes Muscles of Mastication.